Good morning, friends, and welcome to our worship service this morning at the Hildeberg College Church. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Mark 8, 34 to 36, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Mark 8, 34 to 36. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider your word this morning, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and that you will speak to our hearts and minds to the honor and glory of your name, for we ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Today we begin a new series entitled Seeing with New Eyes. And part one this morning is a desire for something better. For many in our world, the most important question they will ever ask is where is the next morsel of food going to come from? For others, it might be, how am I going to meet the next payment? Certainly those are important questions, but the most important question that anyone can ever ask is in reference to eternity. What must I do to gain eternal life. There is just something in the heart of man that is continually searching for something better, something more than what this world has to offer. And God has placed that desire within our inmost being. And that is why Solomon in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. The great theologian Augustine put it this way, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. But for the most part, we become so busy as human beings with the activities, cares, and challenges of this life, that we forget that it is God who keeps our hearts beating. We become so absorbed, so wrapped up in the details of the present, that we fail to see the bigger picture. It's so easy to become bogged down with the narrow picture of our lives in the year and now, that we forget about time and we forget about eternity. Like the man who tore down his barns to build bigger ones, we frequently forget God in our reckoning, trying to build our security on things. Searching, forever searching for something to fill the God-shaped vacuum in our hearts, but looking in all the wrong places, trying to fill that hole with things that don't bring true meaning to our lives. And while searching, most people are actually running away from God, deliberately trying to avoid Him, attempting to hide from the one who designed them the very author of life itself. Some are on the run because they believe Satan's lies. They view God as wrathful, a vindictive tyrant, ready to 
punish those who fall out of line. Others view God as very cold and distant, not really interested in the affairs of this world. Yes, he started everything, but has since withdrawn from planet Earth. Others, again, are so busy building their self-centered private empires that they don't have time to get to know their maker. Secretly, deep down, they are actually afraid of God because they do not know him and have misconceptions about his character. And so they try to block him out of their thinking. But friends, our God is not someone to run from. He is someone to run to. God is not someone to be afraid of. He is someone to be a friend of. Life has absolutely no meaning without a relationship with the one who has made us. You know, I remember once speaking to Jenny about the meaning of life. She was a beautiful, intelligent young lady at university with me. But she was skeptical about religion. What do you plan to do with your life, Jenny? I asked. Well, first of all, I want to complete my law degree. And then? Well, I'd like to set up my own practice as an attorney. And then? Well, I'd like to meet a nice guy, settle down and get married. And then? Well, I'd like to have at least two children. And then? Well, hopefully we'll make enough money to live comfortably and visit a few uh, famous places around the world. And then what? Well, I'll guess I'll have to retire one day. And then? Well, probably grow old and die. And then? Silence. And I could see a little tear run down her cheek as she was thinking about the meaninglessness of life without a relationship with her maker. Dear friend, even if I were to amass a billion rand, but end up outside the gates of the new Jerusalem one day, then it would have been better if I had never been born. Life must surely have some greater purpose than just material things and financial success. And so this series is really about making Christianity real. It's about practical Christianity. This is where the rubber meets the road. We want to address the nuts and bolts of maintaining a vibrant relationship with Jesus and experiencing the joy and the assurance of salvation. It was a rediscovery of these fundamental principles that led to the great Protestant Reformation and brought renewal to the Christian church, which had lapsed into humdrum lethargy and apostasy. Indeed, the correct understanding of these principles will totally renew your spiritual life and transform your religious experience. But an incorrect understanding will lead to an insipid, dull, and joyless Christian experience. And that's why some Christians look as if they have been baptized in lemon juice. They have religion, yes. They have religion. But it's not genuine Christianity. No, friends, true Christianity is a vibrant faith. It is filled with joy, hope, and assurance. God wants us to be glad Ventists, not sad Ventists. You see, it is one thing to know all the doctrines, 
to know the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, to know all the rules, all the do's and the don'ts. But it is a very different thing to actually know God personally, to be his best friend and to have a vibrant relationship with him and to enjoy his powerful, transforming presence in our lives day by day. You know, I can remember when I was ministering in the East London district, there was an elderly lady and she'd become very ill. She was in hospital and I went to visit her. Now, she was a very sincere person, faithful in her church attendance and church duties. But there she was lying on a sickbed and she said to me, Pastor, God feels so far away. I must have done something terrible in my past life. She was focusing on her condition as a sinner rather than on her identity in Jesus Christ. She just could not accept that salvation was something wonderful to be enjoyed and accepted, a gift from God. She was God's precious daughter because of her faith in Him. She had been adopted into God's family. She was a princess in the eyes of God. And she was of great value and great worth to God. Unfortunately, I was able to help her to see that. And she died a few days later with peace in her heart. Friends, if you simply have an intellectual knowledge of some church doctrines, you will never experience the joy, the inner peace that comes from being in a relationship with Christ. Paul calls it in Christ or refers to it as being in Christ. If You will never experience the wonderful certainty and assurance of salvation that emanates from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Hence the importance of this series. You see, when all is said and done, Christianity at its very core is not what you do, but it's about who you know. A personal relationship with Jesus is the sum and substance of the entire Christian life. So in this series, I am really sharing my own personal journey because it's only when I grasped these fundamental principles that my life changed from an insecure state of never being sure if I was right with God and always feeling that I was never good enough to a joy-filled life with the absolute assurance that I am a child of the King. Friends, there are two people that have had an indelible impression on my life and helped me to grow in my understanding of these concepts. One of them is Dr. Hans K. Lorendell, who arguably is the greatest theologian our church has ever produced. And these two books here are the ones that really helped me. And the second person that has had such a wonderful influence on my life and understanding of righteousness by faith is Pastor Morris Venden. And these two books here are ones that have had such a wonderful influence on my life. Now, this morning's message is simply an introduction to the whole series. I want to make sure that we are all on the same page, that we have a common interest that is sometimes merely assumed or taken for granted. 
I want to ensure that all of us have an interest in the things of God, a desire in obtaining eternal life, and that it makes sense to be a Christian and to believe in Jesus. Pastor Venden tells of how one day a friend uh, and colleague came to him and said, Morris, I have a proposition for you. I'd like to give you $10 million. Now, of course, Venden knew that that was a joke right from the start. But he was willing to play along. I'll give you $10 million. But there are two conditions. Just two conditions. Firstly, you have to spend all of it within one year. Now, Pastor Venden would have preferred to lengthen the benefits over a longer period of time. But if that's one of the condi conditions, all right, anything for $10 million. The second condition is that at the end of the year, you come back and you die in an electric chair. I beg your pardon, said Venden. That's the second condition. And there's no way out of it. You have only one year to live. Are you interested? No, thanks. No ways, man, said Venden. Why not? Because he would have been thinking of his death for that entire year, not so. Now, friends, I've tried this same proposition on some young people that I taught religious education in high school. And I haven't found a single person yet, except for the smart aleck in the back row, that will say, yes, I'm interested. But even the guy in the back row come, becomes kind of silent when I start bringing out my million dollars. Why wasn't Pastor Venden interested? Because it would be foolish to live for only one year when you have at least 70 or 80 years to live. Not so. And then Venden's friend shifted gears and brought in the rest of the proposition. Let's pretend that I am the devil. And I come and make you an offer. I have 70 or 80 years to give you. And that's a lie because the devil doesn't have life to give. But that's his proposition. And during those 70 or 80 years, you can do anything you want. No rules, no regulations. Live as you please. Just have pleasure and fun. But at the end of the 70 or 80 years, you come with me into the lake of fire. Are you interested? And I had to admit, from the little I know about human nature, that millions, Yea, billions have taken the devil up on that offer. But friends, what is 70 years compared to eternity? And so if there is a possibility of eternal life, and if people will do anything to live a little longer, then it is mighty worthwhile to consider the things God has planned for those who will accept his gracious offer. Yes, someone will say, that all sounds good, but you can't be sure of this thing which you call eternal life. The reason people choose 70 years of rebellion, pleasure, and sin is because eternity is something nebulous. It's intangible. You can't be certain. You can't prove it. Now, friends, I'm willing to admit that I cannot prove conclusively that there is eternal life. It is by faith that I believe. 
But would you be willing to admit to me that you can't prove that there isn't eternity either? Is that fair? So let's approach this purely from logic and reason. Let's say you take the position that there is no eternal life, but you can't prove that there isn't. And I take the position that there is eternal life, but I can't prove that either. Are you willing to give me a 50-50% chance that I am right if I am willing to give you a 50-50% chance that you are right? Is that fair? I find most people willing to go along with that. All right, so we both live our 70 or 80 years. And at the end of 80 years, we discover that you were right. There is no eternal life. We both die. We are both buried in the same dust, I end up exactly in the same place, place that you have ended up. I haven't lost a thing believing the way I did, have I? But suppose at the end of 80 years, we one day look up and see a small cloud approaching from the east. And suddenly the heavens are filled with radiant beings. It's true. King Jesus is coming again. I was right. There is eternal life. Now, believing the way you did, you have lost everything except for 70 years, which we call time. But time is absolutely nothing in comparison with eternity. Why, time, as, as one person put it, is like a small slab of cheese between two eternal slices of bread. So just on the basis of logic and reason, it is the smart thing, it is the wise thing to believe in eternal life and God's plan for your life. You know, I remember attending an evangelistic campaign when I was just 18 years old. The preacher had a large banner hanging in the front of the hall. And on the banner was a text. Mark 8, 36. What will it profit? What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And for some reason, as a young man, I was mesmerized by that text. I used to carefully go over every word in my mind. Night after night, it burned itself into my memory. What will it benefit a man if he gains the entire world but loses his own soul? That's a powerful text, isn't it, friends? It is one of the most important questions that anyone can ever ask themselves. At the end of what we call time, when Jesus returns in glory, nothing else in the entire universe will mean anything except being anxious and ready to meet him. There will be nothing in this world that will count for anything. Houses, land, Sports cars, clothes, degrees, computers, games, fun, excitement, you name it. Anything and everything that we consider important will fade into nothing. Except, am I anxious to meet the one who made me? Well, someone will say, I know that makes sense. But if you're going to live only for the spiritual and avoid all the sinful pleasures of this world, you're going to have an incredibly boring life. Well, friends, I'll admit that there are a lot of sinful pleasures in this world. And I've experienced a little bit of it. There are some sins that are exciting and fun. Because they appeal to our lower carnal natures. But I've never found anyone who would disagree with this premise. 
It's only fun while it lasts. And when it's over, so is the fun. What I'm trying to say is that the kind of fun that you find in Paris and in Las Vegas is the kind that leaves you feeling less fulfilled afterwards than before you went. And these kinds of places are filled with empty people and walk around with sick masks on their faces. People running over themselves trying to forget that the last fun thing that they tried didn't last. Always searching, searching for something to satisfy the deep longing and the emptiness in their souls. And so they keep trying to find something else that is fun, something that will last. That kind of lifestyle leaves you feeling very empty and unfulfilled. And you continue moving through a cycle, an endless cycle of meaninglessness in life. So yes, I admit there's a lot of sinful pleasure out there, but it doesn't last. In the long run, it leaves us feeling empty and unfulfilled. The God-shaped vacuum that Augustine spoke about, that God-shaped vacuum in your heart has not been filled and satisfied. And so purely on the basis of reason and common sense, it is wise to consider God's plan for your life in this book. Have you already settled that matter in your mind? Is that the direction in which you are moving, dear friend? Yes, I am interested in the things of eternal life. I am interested in thinking about something more than just the moment. I am interested in planning for tomorrow in my relationship with God. In his book, Pastor Venden tells the story of how he was once invited to give the graduation address at a preschool called Kiddies Campus. Learners were graduating from the kindergarten into the first grade. Now, he was not overly flat, flattered by the invitation, but he took his responsibility very seriously, so seriously, in fact, that he became nervous. What do you do to keep these little ones' attention? Well, graduation day finally arrived, and Pastor Venden stood before the class. There they were in their little robes and cardboard mortarboards, standing stiffly to attention. As he stood there before them, he broke out in a cold sweat and thought to himself, the best thing I can do is to get them involved. Listen, class, he said, I want you to imagine that I have something in each of my hands. In this hand, I have a case with one million dollars. But you can only collect it from the bank when you turn 21 years old. Okay? In my other hand, in this hand, I have a 200 rand note. Now, if you choose this hand, you can have the 200 rand right now. If you choose this hand, you have 1 million rand when you're 21. Which hand do you choose? Now, I want you to think very carefully, class, before you make your choice. Remember, you are graduates. And you could see the little wheels in their minds beginning to turn as they were visualizing sweets and chocolates and ice cream cones 
passing by before them. Now be careful, boys and girls. Think this through very carefully. Don't be in a hurry. Yes, we are, sir. Pastor Vendon held out for as long as he could. And finally he said, All right, class, what is your decision? And every last one of them chose the 200 rand. And you could tell by the pleased expressions on their little faces that they knew that he would be happy with their wise choice. Dear friends, from that kind of experience, you come to the realization that maturity, which those little tykes did not have, is willing to forego present pleasures for future rewards. Maturity doesn't think just about the moment. It thinks about tomorrow. A mature person doesn't say, I don't care what happens to me when I'm 70, but changes his mind when he reaches the age of 69. And spiritual maturity says, I will consider eternity and God's gracious plan for my life today. I won't wait until tomorrow. You see, trying to live a fulfilled life without your maker, dear friends, is like trying to lift a great weight with a chain that has a broken link in it. But there is something even more important. You see, God wants to guide us to a point where we realize that there is a much deeper motivation than just wanting to gain eternal life. Which, when you think about it, is actually quite a selfish motive. There is a much more mature reason for becoming a Christian. There are many who seek God purely for the hope of reward or for having some kind of fire insurance, hoping to escape destruction in the lake of fire. And friends, that is really a motive that is driven by fear, not love. That is like having a diving board next to the swimming pool of God's love and grace. And the sad thing is that many Christians spend all their time standing on the diving board. When God wants them to dive into the pool of his love and grace. That's why I offer you a greater incentive. Jeremiah 31 verse 3. God speaking and he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. There is something far superior to just wanting the reward of getting to heaven. And that is to respond in love to the one who first loved us. Does that strike a chord in your heart, dear friend? That is the correct motive and the spiritually mature reason for becoming a Christian. Now, I've heard some people say, I don't need God in my life. But have you ever considered, dear friend, that God may need you? Now I will address that topic in part two of this series. Our Creator is not content with silver and gold or cattle on a thousand hills. He wants people, human beings, created in His very own image who respond to His love. One day I was teaching a teen Sabbath school class. And I decided to give them a little quiz. Just one question. Just one question. What is the first thing you want to do when you get to heaven? 
How would you answer that question, dear friend? What is the first thing you would want to do when you get to heaven? Well, they wrote down their answers, and we collected them, collected the papers. But we as Sabbath school teachers were amazed and discouraged by the answers that were given. The first thing I want to do when I get to heaven is to see my mansion. The first thing I want to do is to ride on a lion. Friends, these are teenagers, not primaries. The first thing I want to do when I get to heaven is to see who else made it. Ever heard that one before? The first thing I want to do is start asking questions. The first thing is to speak to Moses and David. One learner wrote, the first thing I would do, I don't know. I've never thought about it. And another one said, why, if I get to heaven, I'd be so surprised, I don't know what I'd do. These kind of answers went on and on until finally we came across the one answer that we were looking for. The first thing I would do when I get to heaven is to cast myself at Jesus' feet and thank him for making it possible for me to be there. I like that answer, don't you? Dear friend, may I suggest to you that if Jesus is going to be the central focus of my attention when I get to heaven, then he needs to be the central focus of my life right now on earth. Getting acquainted with God by spending time alone with him each day, as with a friend, is the most significant thing I can do with the time allotted to me on this earth. I'm thankful that God invites us, every single one of us, to come and reason together. Psalm 90 verse 12 in the New King James says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The clear word puts it this way. Help us to understand how short our lives really are so we may fill our hearts with wisdom. Dear friends, life is incredibly short. Let's say you live to the ripe old age of 80. 80 years. Now just multiply that by 300 and what's it, 65 days in a year, and you will find that you will live only 29,200 days. That's it, folks. 29,200 days. Life is indeed very short. Our friends, may we be willing to think and wisely plan for something more than just our brief life here on planet Earth. May we stop running and attempting to hide from our Maker. Why? Because God is not someone to be afraid of. He is someone to be a friend of. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus and his great mission of love. We don't deserve it. We haven't done anything to merit it. But our hearts are humbled in awe and gratitude. Lord, please save us from thinking only of the moment. Help us to consider eternity. 
Thank you for your awesome plan of salvation. Help us to respond in love to the one who first loved us. Help us during this series to truly get to know you as our very best friend and to develop a meaningful relationship with you. Whom to know is to have eternal life. Bless us to that end is my prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.